Well, hello there. So today I want to address a question that pops up a lot in my private Facebook group and other forums. And that is, how do I stop wanting partners that I know are unhealthy for me? So first of all, let's define what is an unhealthy partner, okay? So we define an unhealthy partner as perhaps someone who doesn't appreciate you and takes your generosity for granted. Maybe it's someone who shows up with fireworks one day and then disappears without explanation the next. Perhaps they treat you like an intimate partner but don't give you the physical intimacy that you would like, or they only seem to be interested in sex but exclude you from other aspects of their lives. Maybe they avoid labeling the relationship and make you feel neurotic for needing it. Maybe they behave in a needlessly secretive fashion. Maybe they're unfaithful as a way of avoiding intimacy or in order to sabotage the relationship. Or maybe they ignore you for weeks on end and text you, miss you, at 2 a.m. Okay, or on the other end of the spectrum, maybe your partner is intrusive and over-controlling, monitors every move you make, has high demands and never gives you any space, takes everything personally and overanalyzes everything you say, is highly reactive and sensitive and explodes on a dime, uh, presses for too much too fast, interprets everything in the negative, doesn't respect your boundaries or a need for space, expects you to read their mind and then blows up when you don't, is hot one minute and then cold the next, fearful of being abandoned and rejected most of the time, maybe acts out in the extreme after an argument or is unfaithful to get back at you or to boost, boost their self-esteem. So these are some characteristics we're really breaking down and defining unhealthy in relationships, right? And yet, and yet, you still love and want them, don't you? You are still attached to them. And after complaining about all of the above to your best friends, you will defend your partner passionately when you are then questioned by your friends about your sanity <laughs> for staying with this person for as long as you have and still begging the question, no, but can it work between us? Because your friends really want to know why in the hell would you ever hope for such a thing? Why on earth would you still remain with a partner like this that brings you so much pain? Well, according to attachment theory, that is the curse of ambivalence. And that is to say that as much as you might want someone, on some level, you're also equally doubtful and fearful of getting too close to, and that may be because of some history of danger and or threat tied up in intimate relationships. Okay, intimacy was not safe. You learned at some point in your life, and so keeping partners at an optimal distance is like, Hanging out at a slot machine. You're kind of hoping to hit the jackpot with no sense of predictability, but you're addicted in the same way to the intermittent rewards, and you just can't break free of what Helen Fisher calls frustration, atta uh, attach uh, frustration attraction. <laughs> and this is true for both someone who has more of an anxious and an avoidant attachment style. Now, someone who has an avoidant attachment style, what I call a rolling stone, might be a bit more obvious in their tactics, but they will have periods of time in which they'll make bids for closeness, hoping to be rescued from their isolation before the burdens and responsibilities of people-pleasing sink in. And they begin to feel smothered and have to bolt because of the expectation of their partner that they're going to somehow manage their feelings and fill them up, okay? Now, the anxious person harbors a fear that if they were truly seen and understood for who and what they really are, they wouldn't measure up. They might not be worthy enough and thus abandoned and rejected. So who they truly are often remains a mystery even to themselves as they anxiously seek the companionship of someone that they instinctively know isn't going to look that closely, okay? So approaching attachment styles as a spectrum of ambivalence, I believe, tends to allow for some of these variances in experience. Now, ambivalence, again, it's the degree of conflict that you experience around an intimate relationship, how much closeness and intimacy a person wants, and usually this is evidenced by bids 
for contact and sort of uh, preoccupied thinking about when you're going to be connected with that person again versus how much physical and emotional distance and separation they need. And that would be evidenced by avoidant behaviors, thoughts, and or thought patterns, right? And so a person who desires both contact but also has somewhat of an aversion to it struggles with a high degree of ambivalence in relationships. So someone who continues to pursue people that they know are not good for them, high level of ambivalence about intimacy in relationships. And this may be because they're afraid of being over controlled and mentally and or emotionally subsumed by their partner or getting attached and then being abandoned or rejected. I think it's also worth noting here that being over controlled is also a form of abandonment. Okay. But this, this is the thing. Even with a continuum approach like this, there are still holes. So for example, an anxious preoccupied individual, which is someone who is said to have relatively little ambivalence in their anxious behaviors and um, sort of uh, intimacy seeking behaviors, still go primarily and most often for people with avoidant characteristics. It's been observed in the research and anecdotally. And the same is true for dismissive avoidant individuals. So these are individuals who are said to be avoidant with little ambivalence around it. Those who seem to suppress their emotions and dismiss bids for emotional contact and expression as weak or a threat to their sense of self-efficacy and control. Guess what? They also seem to be magnetized to individuals with an anxious disposition that are highly expressive and effusive. So in Levine and Heller's book Attached, which I know many of the many have, have read um, who've come to this place to watch my videos. Most people have touched that book attached at some point. So Heller and Levine refer to this as a case of opposites attract. They call it the anxious avoidant trap. I believe, however, it's really more of a case of like sees like, because it really begs the question, if the anxiously attached individual truly has little ambivalence around closeness, why are they more likely to seek partnership with individuals that prove themselves unavailable for that kind of contact. Similarly, if the avoidant, avoidantly attached individual truly has little ambivalence about cutting themselves off from emotional contact, why are they more likely to seek highly emotional partners that are constantly assaulting those boundaries? Now, these are not really new questions, okay? Neuroscientists and psychodynamic theorists and practitioners have been exploring them for decades. Now, neuroscientists sum it up quite succinctly. Neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So if your early experience of love was painful, your brain is wired to search for similar experiences in adulthood. You understand love as painful. And if it's not painful, it's boring. <laughs> it's not a challenge, right? It doesn't feel passionate. Now therapists and practitioners are perhaps more poetic in describing which is essentially the same condition. It's about reliving in the hopes of revising old wounds. But my question is, what part of our mental, emotional, and spiritual body hopes? What's hoping for a revision here? Is it just your synaptic pathways? Is it just your amygdala? Right? Now, I feel that it is in our increasing discontent our sense of contrast in a relationship that hints at the potential for our highest levels of consciousness, for the possibility of transcending that original wiring and embracing what I'm going to refer to as an ascended love. And that is when the fish finally become aware of the water in which they are swimming, right? And so what is really unique about the work that I do as a creative arts therapist is that we use pleasurable and playful experiences in, with creativity in combination with mindfulness-based practices to really help those mind-body-spirit splits that occur as a result of attachment wounding, that blaze certain pathways in your brain, okay? So it's my thesis, and it has been my experience, both personally and clinically speaking, that mindfulness-based approaches with creative arts therapies interventions are really uniquely equipped to access and to mitigate our attachment hunger, what I call attachment hunger, so that our love relationships can really transform from addictive or avoidant to ascendant. Okay. And if you're interested in learning more about how that plays out, what is the experience of that? How is activating the body somehow gonna help me stop perseverating over a partner that's unhealthy for me? 
I would invite you to check out the sales page for my online course. It's called Healing Attachment Wounds with Mindfulness and Creative Arts Therapies. And it offers seven creative, fun, easy lessons over the course of seven weeks, combining neuroscience, attachment theory, mindfulness-based practices, and creative arts therapies interventions to help illuminate some of the struggles that you may be going through without having to talk in circles around your feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And this is something I notice happens a lot with people with attachment wounding. They've got tremendous insight because their energy has all gone to their head. They've spent a lot of time in their head. But then they get frustrated because they don't feel any differently. And that's because, to my mind, traditional psychotherapy and talk therapies, cognitive therapies, while they can be useful and create spaciousness around our felt experiences, they are a bit handicapped. Because when you're trying to blaze a new neural pathway and shift the way that your body chemistry and your brain organizes itself around your experiences, if you're not addressing the body and activating your creativity in some way, the treatment is handicapped, in my opinion. Okay, so the course that I offer explores the intersections between attachment, complicated grief, and addiction. Because while I tend to believe that attachment hunger is a form of addiction, oftentimes we have other more obviously recognized addictions that go along with our attachment hunger, right? So sometimes it could be food, it could be cigarettes, it could be gaming, it could be shopping addictions, it could be um, drugs and alcohol, things that we do to numb ourselves out by creating momentum around a distraction for us, right? We also look at how to transform anxious feelings and use guided visualizations. I talk about six signs of the anxious avoidant trap and the fantasy of push-pull relationships, and more specifically, the chemicals in the brain chemistry tied up in that. We also look at four parenting styles and their potential impact on adult relationships. We talk about five core brain systems and how that impacts relationships, including attention deficit. And then we also identify how to shed two types of living beliefs that keep you locked in that cycle of self-sabotage. And the last lesson has to do with reclaiming what I call the sacred body and trying to transform unprocessed rage through arts-based approaches. And I also share an inspirational story with you. Now, I have just added on to this package a course. It's called Five Days to Ignite Your Love Light. And this is a pack, this is a, a bonus course that I've added on to Healing Attachment Wounds if you purchase this month. And you can get it for 60% off. And so it's really a course that kind of takes you on the next step to help you activate your soul shaking mojo, right? To bring in that passionate partnership that you want. And so over the course of five days, you learn how to take the fear out of your desire and really get your romantic needs met. How to identify two types of important limiting beliefs that are holding you back, clear those limiting beliefs, replace them with new ones, and bring that creative arts therapies and mindfulness-based interventions in so that you can start practicing a loving vibration. I'm a law of attraction person, so you're going to start raising your vibration. And lastly, in that course, you're also taken on a shamanic soul journey with a guest presenter, the lovely Kristen Boyer, who is a shaman and health coach. And she takes us on a special spiritual journey. So with that, I just want to say that I hope that you have found this enlightening. You've had a few insights here. And if you have more questions similar to this and you'd like feedback, I'd love to see your comments in the feed because that allows me to generate more content like this. So I hope you'll check it out. I'm going to put the links in the caption of this video and I will see you next time.